the best thing for this one. It's losing with your eyes. Don't worry. Tell me who's going to forget. He'll forget. Good morning, one and all. Good morning, sir. Happy New Year. and a new one. Father, we look, we look boldly into the future and know that we have the hope, the hope because you control all things, and we thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that we put our faith and our trust in you. Lord, I pray that we would stand firm with you. Lord, I pray that we would love you in a, in a greater way this year than we did this past year. Lord, I pray that we would love one another in a greater capacity than we did this year. And Lord, the only way we can do that is to know you and to have a great depth of knowledge of who you are. So Father, I thank you for a church that loves to read your word. Lord, I thank you for being a part of a family here that loves to open up and go line upon line and to, to hear from you and to have you direct us and guide us. Sometimes we don't like the words we hear. Sometimes those words are hard to hear. Sometimes your spirit does things in us that uh, it's not comfortable. But Lord, we know you do all those things for our good, Father. We thank you for a God that's hands on. Father, we thank you for the God that loves us and the God that cares for us and provides for us. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. Lord, I lift up my friends and my family before you. I lift up those that are hurting and sick. Lord, I, I pray for Ginger and her family with the loss of her brother this week. Lord, I pray for them, feel comfort. Lord, I pray for um, those that are out here among us, Lord, that are, that are hurting and sick. Lord, I thank you to Jim's back. Lord, I pray for his back and I pray for um, him to, to feel better. Lord, I just thank you that you are a wondrous God. And Lord, that uh, we wake up in the morning and and when we do get the chance to see the sunrise, we thank you, Father, Lord, for just granting us another day because it's a, it's a resurrection day for us. Each and every day that you give to us is a resurrection day, and we thank you for that. So, Father, we just want to be here this morning. We lifted up our voices to you. We're lifting up our hearts to you now. And, Lord, I pray that you would just speak to them. Lord, just speak deep into our hearts and change us and grow us, mold us and shape us, help us to be into the, the conformed to the image of your Son. Lord, we ask that. We we want to know you deeply. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. All right. I was thinking, I banner back and forth when I get through these times around Christmas. It's easy when you just pop a book open and you know you got to go from here to there. But when you get to parts of like Christmas and New Year's and things like that, it's like, what do you do? Do you, do you just throw something out there for, for a New Year's thing? And I was looking for where we stopped before we got into the Christmas season, and we were in First Thessalonians. And I thought, you know what? We're gonna get you guys are gonna get two for the price of one this morning. You're gonna get a, a New Year's message. But you're gonna get it wrapped in First Thessalonians chapter one this morning. So if you want to make your way there this morning, we're gonna finish up this chapter, verses six through ten in First Thessalonians. <coughs> there was a there was a young man who showed up for church on Christmas. And as he, as he was leaving, he shook hands with the pastor by the door. He was walking out. And the pastor looks at the young man and he says to him, Son, you need to be in the army of the Lord. You really need to be in the army of the Lord. And the man said, Pastor, I'm already in the army of the Lord. And the pastor said to him, Then, son, why do you only show up at Christmas and Easter? And the young man looked at the pastor and said, I'm in the secret service. <laughs> You know, we hear that, but that's not really true. There's really no secret service of believers. You know, there's no such thing. And God doesn't want that because either the secret's going to destroy the belief or the belief is going to destroy the secret. And it's really what we want to do with what we know. 
And that's what the message is about this morning. And what we're looking at is this, Paul writes this letter to Thessalonica, and he's commending them for being role models for believers and for unbelievers in the church. He's just thanking them for what they've done. And so Paul talks about the importance of, of being an example, of being a witness, of being a model to one another. So I'm like, what better way to kick out 23, to bring in 24, than to look at how us as Christians who have walked with the Lord for a good deal of time, we should emulate how we should be the model of Christ. So let's read this together, shall we? First Thessalonians 1, chapter verse 6. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you make, that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. And from your from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, who he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. Now to set this up, because we've been away for a few weeks here with this, back in Acts chapter 16, Paul makes his first trip up into Europe. Before this, he was up the northern part, Lebanon, up in that way, Syria. Now he makes his way up into Turkey. We're going to know he goes over the Greeks in the second and third trips. But he first trip in Europe is a little town called Philippi. He comes into Philippi with Silas. He comes into Philippi, and we know what happens. He gets arrested. They get arrested and get thrown in the dark banks of the dungeons, and, they're, and it doesn't look good. And we know that the Lord... Sent a miracle, an earthquake, shook the gates, opened them up, and set Paul and Silas and really everyone free. And it's the famous line that when the jailer comes to him and says to Paul, What this is that I need to be saved? And he says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and your family shall be saved. And then from there, Paul goes to Thessalonica. He goes to the second city. This is his second stop. It tells us there that he only preached there for three weeks. But through that three weeks, he saw a lot of people saved. Prominent people, lay people, poor people. He saw a lot going on there. What we saw at the end of it, which is usually came along with Paul, was a lot of people got saved, a lot of people got ticked off. And so they incited a riot. They got a bunch of people. And they really they drove them out of town. But left behind, we know that, that uh, Timothy was the conduit and Timothy was sending reports and telling him of the things that were taking place and how they had a strong voice. They had a great witness there in Thessalonica, this church that was born. Imagine that coming to a town, a pagan town, a Roman town, and for three weeks all you did is tell Jesus, Jesus, Jesus in the town and, and you established a church there. There was such a strong church after a period of time that they go out and they're a model of behavior to not only the town and the surrounding area, but it tells us that tough all of Macedonia, all of Europe, this, this church stood tall for Jesus Christ. It's amazing because what they came against them is the people that really wanted them out of town, they called Paul and Silas, they called them heretics. And they tell us that back in Acts 17, verse 6, it says, these two men, think about this, these two men were turning the world upside down. That's a great accusation. Two guys telling people about Jesus Christ, and they're turning the world upside down. Some people live their whole life and don't make a speck of difference in the world. Here we have these two guys laying out their lives on the line each and every day, going and telling people, getting arrested, getting beaten, shipwrecked, all the things that Paul went through. And they loved Jesus so much that they turn the world upside down. Because see, that's the world. It's not even a right terminology because the world's, isn't it what you agree that the world's upside down right now? Okay. And what we know is Jesus is believers. We're the ones going around. We're trying to get it set right back in the right place, the right way up. Because it's definitely not right the way this world's acting. 
It's what's up is down, what down is up, what's black is white, what's white is black. It's crazy. It's crazy where common sense has gone to in our country and our world. It's just amazing to me that how we can say and believe things. And like it's, I guess if you say something long enough, I guess people just tend to believe that. Because that's what's going on in the world today. So maybe if we do a little more teaching about Jesus and love about Jesus and telling people about Jesus, maybe they'll start to believe that too. But that's what we're looking for as we go through this day. That's what we're looking for as we head into this year. So Paul writes this letter, has this great reputation. They're model believers. Look what it says in verse 7. He says, you became a model. You became an example. That's what King James says. You became an example to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith really tells us your faith has become known everywhere. And that word model is a Greek word, and it's funny because the Greek word is an easy one, is T-Y-P-O-S, typos. Not an error, but it means a type. They're a model, they're a type. And we know that the model, the type that we are called to model our life after is Jesus. But we are called, as our life unfolds and walks forward through this world, we're to serve as role models. We're to serve as models to other people, other believers and other non-believers. That's what God wants us to do. So what I did is I took four different ways that we should model the Christian life to others. So if you guys want to write this, this is the first one. First one is the question. Do you model the spirit of hospitality? Do you model the spirit of hospitality? Verse 6, Paul writes, Having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. And then down in verse 9, he says, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. So what those two verses are saying is not only did the people of Thessalonica welcome Paul and Silas and his entourage into the city, but they welcomed the message and the messenger. That's what it's saying. They welcomed the message and they welcomed them into their lives, into their hearts. That's a great thing for us. Hospitality is one of the most powerful Christian virtues. This is what this says. Well, turn it. I want you guys to see this. Because I would say, I don't think it's in there, Pastor. I want you to see it. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Keep your finger here. We're not going a lot exploring today. But I want you to see it because I want you to say, I don't think it's in there, Pastor. You've got to read it for yourself. It's in there. So Romans chapter 12. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verse 12. It says, rejoice in hope. Okay, I get that. We can rejoice in the hope. Right? Patient tribulation. Doesn't that, doesn't that seem like an oxymoron? It almost seems like being patient through the trials, being patient through the struggles. Okay, patient. Okay, we can do that. Rejoice in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfast in prayer. That means you got to be praying already. That means you continue to keep praying. Verse 13. Distributing to the needs of the saints, given to what? Hospitality. So I can understand hope. I can understand perseverance. I can understand praying. Distributing to the needs. Okay, you can give. But hospitality is a word that maybe we really don't have a good understanding of. <coughs> Who are people you should invite over to the table? Who do you break bread with? Family? <clears throat> Close friends? See, that's not Christian hospitality. That's a Christian fellowship. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't, I'm not putting that down. That's, that's good. But when you look at the New Testament meaning of what it means to be hospitable, the only time we see hospitality is, is listed here. And when you see that word, it's a word that has, it's broken down into two syllables two words that have one meaning really the first part of it is phileo we know phileo right brotherly love philadelphia the city of brotherly love phileo the second part of it is xenon x-e-n-o-n and that means to a stranger brotherly love to a stranger that's what hospitality is it's not for people we show hospitality to just friends and family in church that's okay to do but what it actually talks about New Testament hospitality is to go forth and share with people that you don't know that well. The people you want to get to know well, or should get to know well. So, brotherly love demonstrated to strangers. 
do we do that? Do we show that sort of love to strangers? When people come to church, new people come into the church, they're strangers looking for friendship. There's there are people that are looking to build something possibly. Are we the ones that go search those people out? And I know that I see. I step back because there's one thing I'd love to do. For all my days, I would go to parties and I would I was married to, and I'm still, thank goodness, because I was married, I could get in trouble with that one. But I'm married to a woman that goes into a party and she knows everybody and they talk to her like she, they know her. And I'm like, how do you know that guy? And she goes, for that lady, she goes, I don't know. I go, they're telling you every depth of their life in five minutes. And I sit in the background and I'm like, hey, hey, hey. I, I'm just not a big social butterfly, but I love to observe. I love to watch people. And I watch you guys when I see new people come in. Because I think the one thing that scares me, I'll, I'll grow up and greet people, the new people, but I don't want to be the guy, the pastor's not the good, it's like to shove everything down their throats. Because they're all oh, the pastors come after, I ain't coming back to this church. As I go and I make myself known and if I can help them, but I watch you guys. And I watch how you guys come around those people. And what a blessing it is because I don't even try to single people out. I know people come into this church and they love getting Shirley's hug. They love getting Shirley. Who doesn't like Shirley's hug? <laughs> yeah, you're like, we make fun. She's got cold hands. You got to watch it. She puts it on your neck and it's cold. But, but there's people, you greet people like that. You love people like that. that that's what we're called to do. That's hospitality. Do you remember? Um, a time when you've done something like that. Invited a stranger, done something for a stranger. Hebrews 13, 2 says, Don't forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. So maybe that time, think this, what if we get to heaven, and after like a bunch of millennia, and we're still on our knees, wondering why we're there? Because we know we don't deserve to be there and see the glory of God. And then we happen to see an angel, and the angel either walks or flies or whatever they do up there, comes over and talks to us and said, Hey, do you remember me? And we're like, I would have remembered you. And they go, No, remember that time, flat tire, you came along, jacked it up, took it off, put it on? That was me. I remember when I didn't I was downcast and I didn't have any money and I was hungry and you were at this place, blah blah blah, and you gave me money or you, you bought me a dinner. That was me. So think about that. When you're doing things out there for people, it might not just be people. It might be agents. That's pretty cool. Isn't it? That's the first one. So are you a model? It has to turn back. We're the model of hospitality stranger. Are we being that model? The second one, do you model, this is a little more difficult when you hear it, do you model repentance from the wrong way of living? Okay, what does that mean? Paul writes here, they were models. Look what they said. They tell you how, verse 9, you turn to God from idols. Now, think about how the order of that statement is. It doesn't say they turn from idols to God, but they turn to God from idols. And that's a difference. That's really a difference. Like I said, Thessalonica was a Roman pagan city. They worshiped Apollo. They worshiped Venus and all this pantheon of, of other gods. That's what they did. When Paul preached his people, he didn't yell at them and say, you got to get rid of the idols. It doesn't say in the scripture he did that. He did that. He didn't do that at all. What he went and did, and it tells us in that first from in um uh, Acts, it tells us what he did is he went and told them who Jesus Christ was. There's a difference there. We don't go, we don't have to go out and scream and yell at people and tell them all the bad things they're doing in their life. Do we really think that people don't know the things they're doing in their life that are wrong? <laughs> really? They know the things they're not doing right. We don't need to tell them that. What, what they don't understand or what they don't know is that they need to know about Jesus. That's the difference. They need to know who Jesus. He called on them to turn to God. And in turning from God, they turn from the idols. That's the difference. Because you can turn to idols. It doesn't mean you're going to turn to God. 
but they turn to God and automatically they're turning from the idols. Some people think it's a two-step process to salvation. Some people think, I got to get cleaned up, then I'm going to come to Jesus. I got to go get rid of the drugs. I got to get rid of the lying. I got to get rid of this. I got to get rid of that. All those bad things in my life. And then I'm worthy enough to come and face Jesus. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says, come to me. All you are heavy laden, all you are sick, all you are burdened, all the problems, come to me and I'll give you rest. And he does the cleaning. He cleans all of us up. Faith is a one step with two consequences. When a person turns to God, they turn from their sin. If they really turn from God, they're turning from their sin. It's like this. This is the active part of our service this morning. Take your hand and put it in front of your face like this. Face in your hand. Look at your face. Now turn it the other way. Is that one action or two actions? Is it one action or two actions? It's one. Two things result in it, but it's only one action. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're turning to God, and when you turn to God, you're turning away from the bad stuff. If we're really walking with the Lord, if we're really seeking the Lord. Two separate actions, really, but it's really only one thing. So you can't turn... You can't turn to Jesus without turning away from our sin. And that's a repentance. Well, you're thinking when you read through this, well, look what they were doing there. They were worshiping idols. They were worshiping pagan statues, all this idolatry, all this sexual perversion. We don't do that here in America. We don't worship stuff like that. We don't, we're not like that. We don't bow down to things. Bow things. I read a quote by Ray Stedman. I like Ray Stedman. He said this, I heard of a Chinese man who visited here was asked upon his return to China whether Americans worship idols. He said, yes, they do. He reported they have three of them. And they, in the wintertime, they worship this little fat guy in a red suit. In the springtime, they worship a rabbit. And in the fall, they sacrifice a turkey. And, you know, we can make fun of that, but a lot of people, what people went through these, these last few days, it wasn't worship of Jesus. It wasn't giving acknowledgement to the King of Kings and Lord of the Lord, who became Emmanuel and came to be with us. It was just what other stuff I could get. And the same might be true of, you know, Easter bunnies and Easter eggs and all the silly things that we do. we got to be careful, because our idols are man-made, and they can put us in problems. So, Repentance. He talks about repentance. He talks about what it really means to repent. Repentance is not just a one-time action. And when we talk about repentance in the Bible, more often than not, it's talking to the church and it's talking to believers. Isn't that amazing? Most of the time you read about repentance in the Bible, it's not about turning from your, your ways the first time and repent and be saved. But more often than not, when you read about repenting in the Bible, it's to the church who should be saved. And it's to believers, if they're believers, they are saved. So it's interesting, isn't it? That it's not just the one and done. We keep doing that. So what does that mean? It means for us as people, the more and more, get this. I really want you to get this. The more, I'm going to read this because I want to make sure I get it right to you. As God reveals more and more truth to us, we must continue to change our mind about truth and bring our beliefs in line with God's word. Did you catch that? The more he exposes truth to you. You know why you read the Bible? You know why you pray? You know why you fellowship? You know why you do all those devotions and things? Because that teaches us. That grows us. And the more we grow, the more we learn, the more he exposes the truth of his word to us. And what we have to do is make sure that we conform to his way instead of him trying to, for him to get to conform to our way. Or try to walk through the world our way. And like, Lord, you're going to honor this, right? I mean, I'm doing this in your name. Honor this. That's not the way to go. It's like we hear the truth, we see the truth, we know the truth, and we conform to that truth. And what he wants us to do with that, it's, 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 it's important because he wants us to get the best. The best of our life. Carry on with this. <clears throat> when we hear, we hear this about this so often, it wasn't used to be once in a while, but when there's a bombing, it's an act by an evil person or an evil group of people. When we hear like a, a plant explosion, a, a plant exploding somewhere, and maybe there's people hurting that as well. 
a lot of times people will be like, why do these things happen? People question, why do things happen like this? What is the, why? Why, do, why does that happen? Why were these people killed? Why were these people wounded? And then people they will ask you, well, did they deserve it because they were bad people? That God was using this as a way to take out some bad people? Is that what he did? Did these firefighters or these first responders that came up on the scene? They were actually bad people, so the Lord says, well, I might as well get rid of these guys. That's not how he operates. That's not how he works. People think that, though. Now, there's not easy answers, and, and there's, but there's always one big truth. We live in a fallen, sinful world with evil people. Fallen, sinful world with a bunch of evil people. And because of that sin, we live in a messed up, natural world. That's a byproduct of it. Evil people... Simple world. Romans 8.22 tells us that the whole of creation groans and labors with birth pangs. That means they're groaning to be redeemed. The groaning nature is the reasons we have tornadoes and accidents and things like that. It's not like God sent these things to wipe out a group of people. No, it happens because of what we are. We're evil people and we're living in a fallen world. It's not a perfect world. I don't think I have to tell you guys about that. But if you think God caused these events to happen, a bombing, a building falling, something like that, then you need to repent because that's stinking thinking. Stinking thinking. That's not a good way of thinking. We need to repent from our way of thinking. You need to change your mind about God. I want you to see, I'm not making this stuff up. Turn to Luke, chapter 13. Because what better way can we draw from the example of understanding this to show us what it is than having Jesus himself talking about it? Luke, chapter 13. <clears throat> Okay, Luke chapter 13, verse 1. There were present at that season some who told them about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse Sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now you come back to this and put it in context. In verse 1, when he talked about the Galileans, when they were going around offering their sacrifice, their Passover sacrifice, that Herod was going and he's killing the people. So their question in verse 2 was, do you suppose... That these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things, like a bombing, like a bloody act that would take place here today. It's just an act of a wicked person. This was an act of a wicked person here in verse 1. Someone that just wanted to wipe out good people. You look down to verse 3, and it says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Unless you repent, unless you change your way of thinking. They were blaming God. God, these were bad people. You did this. No, this was an act of an evil person. Look at verse 4. Are those 18 of whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? Apparently, they knew something was going on. There was a tower that was built in Siloam, and it fell down, and 18 of them were killed. A natural occurrence. Nobody bombed it. It fell down. We live in a fallen world. Things happen. Earthquakes, tornadoes, disasters. Those happen because the world is a fallen world. And then he says the same thing in verse 5. He says, unless you repent, you're not, you don't get it. It's not good thinking. You have to repent. Change your way of thinking. The world's always had the Nero's, the Pilots, the Hitler's. The terrorists of 9 11. They're, they're going to continue on. They're, they're just going to happen. 
and we've always had to deal with all these natural disasters that come and go. Those things just keep coming across in our nation, in our world. But instead of blaming God, which we have tends to do, don't we don't the, the world doesn't want to give lift God up when he saves something, when a plane drops out of the sky or something and it directly lands and nobody gets hurt. Nobody praises God in such a way that they pray, they they slander him and call, why would God do this to people? Why would God let this happen? He always want they always want to make him the brunt of being the bad guy all the time, and not much of lifting him up. But that's the world. But instead of blaming him, we should be changing the way we think. And the world needs to change their ways of thinking. R.C. Spall, a great writer, says uh, this verse. He says, you people are asking the wrong question. You should be asking me, why did that tower fall on my head? Because people go around and they love that question, why do what? Bad things happen to who? That's not the right question. The question is, why do good things or why do bad why do good things happen to bad people like me? Why does God in his mercy show me love and compassion and blessing when I'm just a sinner and I don't deserve anything? That's the question. Not why should bad things happen to good people, but why do good things happen to people that aren't so good? Because the Bible tells us there's no none good except who? Except God. There's only one good. It's only Jesus Christ. Turn back. <clears throat> that, requires, that requires us to think. To think. Are we a model of repentance? That's the second one. Are we a model of repentance to other believers? The third one is, this is easier, do you model obedience to God? Look at verse 9. Part of this verse 9. As it says here, to serve the living and true God. What was he doing here in the context? He was taking God and contrasting them with the idols. And the idols are dead and false, and God is true and living. That's the contrast. That's the difference he's showing us here. Our motivation, he tells us, is obedience and love. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Next chapter, he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So does it make sense to keep his commandments? Because if you keep his commandments, if you keep his way, you're abiding in the love of God. That's a good place to be abiding. That means where you're living. Where are you living? Are you, are you, are you abiding? Are you living in Christ? Are you living in the fellowship with Jesus? That's a question we got to cast ourselves. You know, we're going to talk a little baseball here. You know that Moses was a baseball player? <laughs> He's laughing. Moses struck out. He did. Numbers chapter 20. Remember Jesus? Because all the people were griping, and they were thirsty. And he told Moses, Moses, I want you to go up, and I want you to speak to the rock. Speak to the rock, and the water's going to come out. Because back in Exodus chapter 17, a bunch of years earlier, the Lord came to Moses, and the people were still complaining. How did the job of Moses? All those people wandered around, and all they do is complain, 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 complain. So the first time it happens in Exodus 17, the Lord came to him and says, Moses, go up and speak to the rock. I'm sorry. Come, 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 strike the rock. Struck the rock, first time. Struck the rock, water came out. People were happy they had water to drink. A bunch of years later, move ahead. The Lord comes to Moses and says, Moses, speak to the rock. And Moses is ticked off with these people. He's sick of the, gr the grumbling and griping and everything going on. He's tired. And he goes up and he doesn't speak to the rock. He goes up and strikes it not just once, but twice. And we know that the, the rock was smitten. And we know who the rock is. The first time it was smitten the first time, he only had to be smitten once. Our Lord and our Savior was smitten one time for us for all. He didn't need to be smitten again. <clears throat> But he goes and he smites the rock twice. He hits the rock twice. And does water come out? It says it came out abundantly. Even though he erred, God honored and gave to his people. But God comes to Moses and Aaron and says to them, tells them, he says in Numbers chapter 20, he said, you know what? You're not going to be able to lead the people into Canaan. Not because he hit the rock. Because he disobeyed. And he says, I need someone 
that's going to obey me to lead the people into the promised land completely. Moses was a great leader, but he had a little bit of a temper. And I can understand it. I couldn't imagine being around those people all that time. <clears throat> and so we know Moses, you know, Moses is there. We know he's in the promised land. But he needed a leader, and so who does God choose? He chooses Joshua, Yeshua, to lead him into the promised land. The first test of all the places they go to, God doesn't send them to, remember the first test was Jericho, the second test was Ai. He doesn't send them a little Ai like the size of Senate. He sent them to the mighty Jericho with the fortress, powerful fortress, in any of the surrounding area, that's where God sends him to. And he takes Joshua aside and says, this is the battle plan. And Joshua says, yeah, what are we going to do? We're going to get him. We're going to go after God, right? What are we going to do? How are we going to smite him? What are we going to do with these guys? God says, first thing we're going to do? Yeah, what are we going to do? We're going to walk around the city. Okay, what are we going to do tomorrow? We're going to walk around the city. Every seven days, we're going to walk around the city. But on the seventh day, we're going to walk around the city seven times. That will put the fear of them. And then we're going to blow our trumpets. Joshua didn't go, what are you talking about? <laughs> I don't think Moses would have done Moses would, I think Moses would have had his own battle plan. He would have I'm ready to go. But Joshua was obedient. We know the outcome of the story, don't we? They walked around the city the seventh day, seven times. They shouted, both blessed the trumpets and shouted. What happened? Walls. Walls came tumbling down. That's obedience. That's obedience when you don't understand all the things that God's doing in your life. If God came to you and said, I want you to march around on for seven days, I could take a cab. I could take an Uber. I could ride my bike. I'm not going to do anything? No, nope, don't say anything to anybody. Just ride around. Would, would you have done that? That's who he needed. He didn't need Moses in that situation. He needed Joshua. He needed someone that was going to listen to him. Get this. I want you to make sure you get this point. Listen up. Wake up. In our walk with God, there is times when he guides us into deeper and deeper truth. At each point, we must obey him. When we stop obeying and serving him, that's when we forfeit the very best he has for us in life. Get that. When we don't do what he wants us to do, when he shows us the course to take, then we know the right way to go. When we don't take that way, we only rip ourselves off. That's not the best. He may give you the best, but he can give you even better than the best. He wants what's best, the best for you. When we don't do it, we're only ripping ourselves off. That's what he's showing us here. Are we obeying him? Are we obeying when we read the Bible? Are we listening to it a bit? Last turn here, guys. Turn over to James because James ordered in your Bible. First and second Thessalonians, Titus, and Hebrews, and the book of James. That's where we are. James chapter 1, verse 22. And I know you guys know this verse because we say this word about verse all the time. <clears throat> but there's something deeper here, guys. <clears throat> Something deeper. Verse 22, James 1. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So if we just hear it, we don't do it, then we're, we're deceiving, we're lying to ourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the words and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this one will be what? Blessed in what he does. We can hear it, but without doing it, we don't get blessed. When you look into a mirror, you, you're able to, you wake up in the morning, you, you look in the mirror, you're able to evaluate yourself when you look into that mirror. That will, that's why we have mirrors. Is my hair right? My makeup, uh, uh, ladies, your makeup sound good, all those things. That's what we look at. There's two ways to look into a mirror. There's a gaze and there's a glance. And there's a difference. I mean, I grew up in the 70s. You remember 
the show Happy Days. Okay. I mean, it was like Richie Cunningham, but really the, the star of that show was the dude in the leather coat. Fonzie. Fonzie would walk past the mirror, he'd look at the mirror, he'd pull out his comb and go, hey. You know why? He didn't have to touch it because he was perfection. That's what he saw. He saw perfection in the mirror. He glanced in the mirror. <clears throat> That's not what we're called to do. We're called to gaze into the Word of God, not glance into the Word of God. We're called to gaze into it. We're called to look into it. We're called to study it and absorb it and take it because we all know this be hearers of the Word but doers of the Word. We understand that. But how often do we understand when you get to verse 20, 25, it says, but don't forget that forgetful hearer but a doer of the Word, this is one that's going to be blessed in what he does. You hear it, you do it, you're blessed. If you just hear it and you don't do it, he may bless you, but it tells us here, God guarantees us. You hear it, you do it, you're blessed. Amen to that. Thank you, Jesus. So gaze into it. I tell you, when you play follow the leader, it's an awful lot easier to follow the leader when you're that much closer to the leader. If you're in the back of the pack, it's hard to see the actions going on up front to follow the leader the way he should, the way he's going, the way you can incorporate into your life, the way he's doing things. And if you're closest to Jesus, it's easier to emulate Jesus. But if you're not spending time with him and sharing with him and let him share with you, then it's a lot harder to emulate him because you're not there with him. So I pray that we do that. Last one. So the first one's hospitality. Are we hospitable people? Do we model hospitality? And I don't mean just when we talk about hospitality, doesn't mean you have to bring them into your own house. You can be out and about doing stuff and be hospitable to people. Loving, loving strangers. Brotherly love for a stranger. Second one is that model repentance. Letting people understand when things are wrong, we show that we have we, we do something, we see something in our life that's that's not what we think. Maybe the world thinks a certain way. We gotta make sure we explain to them, no, it's not the bombings. Things found out that's not God being mad at us. We live in a fallen world with fallen people, with evil people. We have to, when we see things that we need to change in our thinking, we must incorporate that. And then the third one was this model of obedience. That are we obedient to the Word of God? Are we, the thing is, like people, you know why people don't read the Word of God? They don't want to be obedient to the Word of God. That's why they don't read the Word of God. The last one here is do you model hope? as you look for the return of Jesus. Look what it says in verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, who he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. As they wait for his son from heaven, the early believers expected Jesus to come back. They expected Jesus to come back soon. But they didn't go and sell all their stuff, quit the job, and go stand on a mountain somewhere and look up in the stars. They didn't do that. They continued to work, and they continued to have that, that expectation that Jesus was going to come back. They lived with an exciting expectation that Jesus was going to return soon. We're, we're citizens of the United States, but we're followers of Jesus, so we have a dual citizenship. This is what Paul writes in Philippians. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. This is a messed up, screwed up world. I don't have to tell you that. We know that we live in it. And there's a lot of people that are afraid about the future. People are afraid about what is to come. And the reason we have fear is because we don't trust in the Lord. When we have fear, we're saying the circumstances in my life, the circumstances that surround us, the circumstances that confront us are bigger than what God's going to do for us. That's what fear is. Fear is placing something that bigger and <coughs> placing it bigger and above what God can do. That's what fear is. Thinking that God can't handle things. I tell you, as believers, we have the most valuable commodity that the world has to offer. It's not money. It's not oil, it's not gold, it's not fame, it's not power. It's not any of those things. It's H-O-P-E. Hope. As Christians, we have hope. Just like grace is God's riches at Christ's expense as an acronym, hope is an acronym. 
It's having only positive expectations. Having only positive expectations. And it is the most valuable commodity because you can't buy it. It's a gift. And that gift comes from God. And if we're going to work one word, what is the word hope? What does the word hope mean to you? The word hope to each one of us should be Jesus. Because Jesus gives us that hope. I Paul wrote to Titus, and he says to him, we are looking for that what? That blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The blessed hope. We're just waiting for him to come. We're waiting for him to come and take us out of here. You know, because the world's not wandering in some misguided direction with no destination in sight. It's, it's not that way. God is bringing his creation to his planned conclusion that Jesus is going to come and Jesus is going to reign. We just went through that with Revelation. We know that. It's funny because I closed with this because I watched back when we had a house where we used to live farther outside the city. There was a big bay window there. And when someone pulled up, up in our driveway, the lights would shine through that window when kids were little. Remember that? they come running and jumping on our big, we had a big section of couch. And they come running, wanting to know who's there. they come jumping on the section of couch, uh, jump through the window, and their face would be smushed all over the window, and it would leave streaks. So like every few days or week, I'd come home, and I'd walk in the front door, and I'd look over the window, and you can see it's all streaks with face prints all over the thing, because the kids were always wondering who was coming up the driveway. And I'm like, that's how we should be in the windows of our lives, looking for him to come back, expecting him to come back, waiting for him to come back with a glorious expectation, that blessed hope that he's coming back for us. But until then, as we wrap up 2023 and we look forward to 2024, are we good models? Are we good models of what a Christian should be? And I always like the end of the year because it sort of gives us a, uh, a good look in, in introspection about how the year was and what the new year can be like. And so my challenge to me and my challenge to you is what do you want to model to this world when we go forth today? One story, and we're done, I promise. I was growing up, I was really close to some, some teachers in high school. I loved history, and um, I was working in a summer job, and I came across one of the teacher's wives that I got to go on a bunch of trips. We went to Washington, D.C. to get everyone to Gettysburg. And, Mount Vernon and all these different places, and I ran into this guy's wife, and I hadn't seen him in a few years, <clears throat> and I asked about her husband, who was one of the teachers, and I go, how's Mr. Edmonds doing? And she goes, uh, Mr. Edmonds passed away. And I go, I'm sorry to hear that. He was a good guy. He was a funny guy. And um, and, she, and I, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. And she looks at me, and she says, don't major on minors. And I never, I was probably, I was probably like 1970. 778. I never heard that expression before. And she said, don't major on the minors. And that's all she said. But I'm thinking that maybe something happened in her life with him. That maybe the last thing she said, maybe as he walked out the door, they had a little scuffle. They had a little, a little, you ever had those you walk out the door and you just, never mind, I'll talk to her about it later. I'll just, you know, you just sort of grumpy and you just let it be. Well, apparently to my thought that she, he walked out the door and something happened. And they never got to resolve that conflict, that discussion, that disagreement. And so she said, don't major on the minors. And you know what? It's all minors, guys. If I'm, I don't want to waste my time arguing with my wife. I don't want to waste my time arguing with my kids or having disagreements in the church or and things like that. That's just a waste of our time. That's the work of the enemy. That's not modeling Christ. Modeling Christ is to show love hospitality. It's to admit when I'm wrong and have a, uh, God opens up the book to me and shows me different ways of thinking that I didn't understand because the more I spend time with them, the more I have an understanding that I don't know hardly anything. And I got to keep searching because God keeps putting it in me. And when I, when I see something new, I say, Lord, I'm sorry for the way I was and I don't want to be that way. And then I want to be obedient. And because I, when I have those other things, then I really have the hope of him coming. And I look forward to his coming, as we all do. But don't major on minors. Don't, don't, don't get caught up in 
things. Be caught up in loving him and loving other people. It's not easy to do, but it's simple. And so I pray this we go through the year. Question. Write this down, tack it on your fridge, tack it on your mirror. What sort of a model of a Christian am I going to be in 2024? Amen? Amen. Amen. Father God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for these folks, Lord. I pray your hand would be upon them. Lord, I pray that you would protect them and watch over them. Lord, I, I pray as we look forward to your return, Lord, maybe you'll even come back before 2024 even gets here. If you do, Lord, I pray that we will go out these doors. We can... We can pull out uh, just a, uh, an opportunity to go and share the gospel and show some hospitality and some obedience and hope and love to one another. Lord, if we if we do carry on and, and you tarry because you know the perfect time that you're coming back, uh, Lord, I pray that we would just be the models that you want us to be, to be the examples you want us to be. So, Lord, I, I thank you for these folks, Lord, and I, I just pray that your hedge of protection would be around them. Lord, I pray that they would feel the feeling of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I, I pray that we would dig into your word and know you in a greater capacity this year. Lord, it's amazing when I open up this book, how many new things I see here. Lord, you're, you're so good. You're, you're so awesome. And Lord, I just pray for my brothers and sisters. Lord, let them feel your love. Let them feel your compassion and blessings upon them, Lord. Let them, let them, just, let them live in that, Lord. And let that just emanate from them and through them. Lord, we just thank you. We just love you, Lord, so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. So we have a few minutes to talk. Uh, people, Sunday school people, part of the Friday night group. we got new curriculum. We just want to look over that real quick and make sure you guys know what we're all doing.